Hey everybody, Hipster Username here. We're gonna run through a couple of basic ways of using the Unified Canvas, give you a nice solid foundation of understanding to start using Invoke and incorporate its capabilities into your artistic workflow. So let's get started. The first concept I wanna talk through today is the bounding box. The bounding box is this dotted square that is on my Unified Canvas and I can move it around by using the move tool in the top toolbar or using the V hotkey in order to easily switch to that. But the important thing to note about the bounding box is that it is how we tell Invoke where to focus. It is where new generations will occur and specifically helps us frame what we want Invoke to generate. The first thing that we might wanna do with Invoke on the Unified Canvas is get started. So we can either use one of our existing images from the gallery uh, by right-clicking and sending to Unified Canvas. Or if we don't want to take an existing image, we want to generate something new, configure our settings, and then hit Invoke. I'll close a couple of menus there. And once we've generated an image, you'll notice a selection bar down at the bottom. This is going to be something that we see routinely when using the Unified Canvas. When generating something new before anything is saved and merged to the canvas, we have the option to accept it, take a peek what's behind it. If I do that right now, there was nothing to start. Save that new image to the gallery, just in case we wanna keep it, but don't want it to stick around and discard that. If we generate more than one image, we'll also have the ability to move left and right and view those before choosing one, but we can only choose one. For now, I'll go ahead and accept this new image especially when we're doing things like outpainting and inpainting. One of the most important concepts to understand when using Invoke and Stable Diffusion is the power of context. Whenever we're generating a new image that is being supplied with existing image information, so if we're using image to image, inpainting or outpainting, if you don't know what those are, we'll talk about those in a second. But anytime we're using one of those that is being passed in some amount of visual context, Stable Diffusion has access to all of the visual information that is inside of this bounding box to produce a better image, but it has none of the context for what is outside. To demonstrate this, we'll talk about the in-painting feature next and cover some of the concepts that are needed for that. We'll be touching back on this concept of context throughout this video because it's extremely important. So let's talk about in-painting. What is in-painting? Very often when we generate images with Stable Diffusion, there are gonna be some aspects that we like and some that we don't. Or maybe we have an existing image, a picture of ourselves and our friends that we wanna tweak. Uh, we wanna put a parrot on our shoulder or a funny hat on someone's head. In painting is about taking small parts of the image and transforming them. So in this image that I just generated, uh, everything looks great, it was about the sunset, the blurry ocean in the background, the focus on the bottle, but it says on ERP in the middle of my bottle, which is not really the message that I was hoping for. Uh, so, so what I'm gonna wanna do is I'm gonna wanna instruct Invoke to focus on that specific area and keep everything else. And that is gonna bring us to our first concept for inpainting, which is the base and the mask layer. The base layer is this image. The base layer is what we have generated already. It is the image that we have brought in and it includes anything else that we have generated and accepted. If we use our brush tool on this layer, we're actually drawing on the image kind of like a um, you know Photoshop or paint. Uh, we don't wanna keep that of course. If I erase this image, I'm actually deleting image data out that is gone. And all of the other tools on this toolbar are gonna to be affecting the actual image content itself when I'm on the base layer. However, when I switch to the mask layer, my brush tool now becomes a masking tool. And you can confirm you're on the mask mode by looking at your masking options. Uh, the masking options show a, a couple of different settings that you can use when you're masking. I'll cover those in a second. But for now, let's go ahead and mask the area that I want Invoke to regenerate. When I have a mask on an image inside of the bounding box, Stable Diffusion will focus on generating only within transparent and masked areas. What that means is it'll leave everything else inside of the image intact, except for this masked area. What I mentioned earlier about 
context is that this image information is going to inform what goes inside of the in painting. Specifically, this region outside of this aerial will be passed in as context. Stable Diffusion will try to match what is inside of this entire image to this prompt. So in this case, I actually want to keep my prompt the same. However, let's make the bounding box a little bit smaller so that I can show you what I mean by context. I have a setting turned on right now that is shading everything outside of the bounding box darker. It's in the canvas settings, so you can see it darken outside selection. I find this to be a really good reminder of what Stable Diffusion is going to be seeing and trying to generate. So in this context, there's no ocean, there's no sunset, there's just sand, and there's a bottle in it. And I want it to regenerate the bottle. With my bounding box framed around this specific area, I probably want to update my prompt in order to better describe to Stable Diffusion what it is seeing. Because again, it's not seeing anything outside of the bounding box. It's just seeing this small picture. I almost like to think about this as if I went to a museum and I saw just what was inside the bounding box. What title would I give that image? And so in this case, I'm going to say a bottle in sand with a message inside and we can probably leave the beach. I'll take the sunset out. And you'll notice I've got a perfectly crafted negative prompt here. I don't want to see everything bagels and cream cheese. So this prompt is now updated and effective. But before I do, I'm going to go ahead and give myself a couple of options here. Anytime I do in painting or out painting, I typically like to see more than one option. So I'll go ahead and up that to five. So now we can see a couple of different options available to us. All of them still seem to have this strange text. And I'm not a big fan of how it is manipulating this bottle. So I'm going to go ahead and discard all of these. In fact, I'm going to uh, move my bounding box just a little bit here to focus on the bottle. And we'll talk about why this is happening. Uh, so for just a moment here, I'm going to turn my mask off and I'm going to zoom in and we'll talk about what, what is inside this image. The entire image's red, green, and blue values, basically color, is being passed in to Invoke. The area that is being selected by the mask is being run through the same type of logic that you would see with image to image. So it's taking all of this color and it's trying to re-manipulate it to fit the prompt and transform the image into what we're hoping to see. It's just doing that on the area that is masked. So something that I want to do is I want to take a look at the base layer and I'm going to turn this mask off. And because we do have this text on the image, I actually want to go ahead and see if I can get this out. Uh, we'll go ahead and fill the bottle with a little bit more of this yellow color. So it's all coherent. And then I'll see if I can get a little bit of a brown going and get the original message I was going for in the bottle. Ended up looking a little bit like a pretzel stick, but the magic of Stable Diffusion will save us. And I'm realizing my image to image strength popped up at some point here is at 99. And I think what we're gonna wanna do now, if I generate at 99, I'm effectively saying ignore almost 99% of the image and generate something new, uh, which will actually give us something completely different. Although this isn't too bad uh, in this particular case, I think it's not, it's not what we're going for. And we're going to want to go ahead and bring this image to image strength down to something like 0.7. Nothing that I would say fit exactly uh, but we'll go ahead and accept this one not because i like it uh, but because we can just use what it's generated to generate again and feed that forward into another image and i think we might find something useful here i actually think this one will look good as well and I think in this particular case, I'm fighting a little bit with the prompt here. So maybe I just need to do some prompt tweaking to get what I was originally hoping for. Uh, we'll start with the message. And as I read this, I'm starting to realize a message 
in a bottle is an idiom that we understand as humans. But if I'm describing a picture to a computer, the message might be what's confusing this. I, I don't really want to use the term message. What I really am thinking of is a rolled piece of paper inside a bottle on the beach. And maybe this is what's going to give us something that's more along the lines of what I was thinking. And we'll move the image image strength down just a little bit. And this is actually perfect. I, I think this one turned out really well. So sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get to uh, what we're looking for. Playing around with what we're focusing on, what our prompt is, all of those things are going to help us get to the uh, final image we're hoping to see. I'll turn my snap to grid back on and pull the bounding box to the full image so we can see this. Now I talked through a little bit about generating new content and fixing parts of images, but one of the useful tools of the unified canvas is expanding uh, our canvas. And in this case, context is just as important. So if, for example, I were to continue to use this prompt, the context of what I'm passing in to the generation process is incredibly important. Note, I've got a bottle with a rolled piece of paper inside the bounding box here. And if I move the box 128 pixels left on the grid, I no longer have the bottle anymore. If I were to outpaint now, Stable Diffusion would think it needs to generate another bottle because it doesn't know one already exists outside of the box. So if I'm actually wanting to generate, what I'd want to do is make sure that I've got the context in here, or if I want to generate this much new information in the image and I don't want to show the bottle, I would need to update my prompt. Either way works, both are extremely valid. For the purposes of giving examples, I'll show you a failed attempt and then both of the possible paths towards getting the intended effect. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and leave our prompt I'm not including the bottle inside of my outpainting, and I will now see a new bottle pop up. Various strange examples of how this outpainting was not what we hoped it would be. And I'm now realizing there are two things that I did wrong here. First, obviously the bottle concept is having to get created and we see a couple of attempts to do so throughout all of these images. There's this like small cup and a ball. Uh, yeah, th this is definitely not great. So the bounding box should definitely, if I was going to leave the prompt here, been moved over to include this. But I'm also noticing that I left my image to image strength low. When I'm out painting, I'm creating a lot of new noise that needs to be transformed. And so this needs to be very high. I. This will only affect the new outpainted area. And so anytime we're doing outpainting, this should probably be all the way up. And I'll move my bounding box back to include that bottle. And now we'll see what we get when we have all of the context we need to fit the prompt. And remember to turn our image to image strength up all the way. So as expected, no new bottles, just beach. And so we've got a couple of options for our beach, most of which have some noticeable seam. And I think this one's a perfect example. I love the flow of this image, but there is a seam here. And so I'll have to go in and see if I can fix that. Now I'll call out briefly the seam correction settings on the left-hand side. These actually control how Invoke is generating the seam. The size of the seam will dictate how many pixels to the left and right of that seam it will blend. The blur will affect how much of a blur is applied to that area. The strength will control how strong of an in-painting process will be applied to that area. And the steps dictate how many steps that process will take. In this case, I want to go ahead and accept what I've got. I won't do a full deep dive on seam correction here. 
but I encourage you to play around with it and tweak it so that you can see how you can control that seam in your generations. Uh, so I'll go ahead and accept. I do want to fix this seam a little bit, so I'm going to go ahead and mask, and I'm going to go ahead and capture a couple of the areas where the seam is particularly noticeable. And then I will go ahead and invoke. This one probably did the best job, although there's still a little bit that I can tell uh, has some issues. So I'll take care of that. And then we should probably be good with this one. Yeah, this looks a lot better. I think this is okay. We could probably spend 45 minutes tweaking this, but I won't put you through that. Uh, we'll go ahead and accept, and I'll go ahead and showcase the other side of this uh, with the different method that I described earlier. So if I want to extend the bounding box past what I had originally, and I don't want another bottle to get generated, well, I can just update my prompt, remove that piece, and focus on the beach. The beach at sunset, photography, golden hour, so on and so forth. Now I can also, while doing this, include what I expect to see on this side of the image. So in my mind's eye, this beach continues on and what would describe the image that's inside this bounding box if I had to give it that label at the museum? Well, something like maybe an umbrella and chair on the beach at sunset. Might as well. Let's see what we get. Oh man, this one's a little bit of a mess. Uh, well, let's take a look at what we got. We can figure out how we want to move on from here. Uh, so no chair on this one. The umbrella is there. The sand clearly doesn't really match the sand I've got going on over here. Uh, again, context. All Stable Diffusion had was this image. It doesn't know what the sand looks like over here. It doesn't know how to make this half consistent with this half. So a lot of this is it trying to make do with what it's got, which was a little bit of context right here. Typically, it's a bad idea to generate so much new information in one go. You want to provide as much context throughout the generation process. So really what I should probably have done is very similar to this side, include a lot more of the original image, maybe include that bottle, generate one or two extensions of the image before I tried to get some of that new information in. But we'll go ahead and take a look at what else we've got to see if there's anything salvageable. Don't even think you could convince me that's a chair. This one actually is a chair and an umbrella. It's not great, but it, is, but it does fit. This chair is just facing away from the ocean. And this chair actually, well, it looks okay. I like the chair. The sand looks kind of like it fits. It needs some in painting. It's just missing my umbrella. But I can fix that. So I'll take the chair and I'll add an umbrella. And now all I need to do is mask it. And we'll do some in painting. Okay, I've got a couple of umbrella options here. They seem to have manipulated the ocean as well. This one actually looks super cool though. I like I don't I don't really know what it is. It's it's maybe some kind of bioluminescent mushroom umbrella, but it looks kind of cool, so you know, whatever. I don't I don't look a gift horse in the mouth. I'll take it. And then we've got a couple of steam issues we've got to fix up on this side. So we'll go ahead and just take that beach out. Take a look at our options there. 
Uh, that one looks pretty good. And we'll go ahead and give this one up through the top a couple of Now, what I'm realizing is I've been leaving my image to image strength high, which is creating a lot of these uh, versions of this that don't really fit into the image. So I'm just going to discard these real quick. I'll bring the image to image back down a little and we'll regenerate. And those fit a lot better. Uh, this one actually looks pretty good. So I'll take that. So we've got our image. There's certainly some areas that need some additional love. But hopefully this set of trial and error helps you figure out your own usage of the unified canvas. It obviously takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of getting used to how to talk to the system and how to get what you want out of it. But I'm confident that once you've played around with it, it'll start to feel pretty intuitive and you'll start to explore a lot of different ways of using these features to generate what you want to see. Now, before we wrap up, I want to quickly run through all of the toolbar options that are available as of the 2.2.4 version of Invoke. And then we'll wrap this one up. So I've already talked about the base and mask layer switcher. You can switch using the Q hotkey masking options. We've got our enable mask button, which just allows you to very easily toggle the mask on or off. Obviously, if I draw a mask and switch to the base layer, that mask is still in effect. But if I use the hotkey for enabling the mask, it'll actually take that and disable it. The other options related to the mask are preserve masked area and colors. Preserve masked area inverts what is being passed into the outpainting process. So in this case, I'm telling Invoke, I want to preserve this bottle, keep this bottle the same. We also want to keep our magical um, mushroom umbrella the same as well. If I were to generate now, it would keep those areas the same and pass in everything else to that generation process. And as far as color goes, mask color does nothing to the generation process. It doesn't inform anything. It just helps you look really cool, obviously, and also helps you see the mask on certain image colors when it would be a little bit too similar to the color of what you're masking. The last option is the clear mask button. This is really useful. Uh, I use the hotkey quite a bit in this video, shift C, uh, but clearing the mask just deletes everything that is already masked. I've already talked about the brush and eraser tool, so I won't dig into those too much more. Fill bounding box will take whatever color you have set for the brush and fill in the entire bounding box with that color. As far as use cases for that, typically the way you would use it is maybe you want to extend up and you want to fill this area in with blue before drawing your own masterpiece. We'll do a color picker, pick that blue there, and then fill in the bounding box at the top. And so now I could, you know, draw my heart's content, all of the clouds that I want up here, and then generate. Um, and when I decide that that's a terrible idea and all I have done is made a very poor Microsoft Paint drawing, I can use the Erase Bounding Box area to delete that. Erase Bounding Box is super useful if you decide there are areas you want to crop out of the image. Let's say, for example, this part, I decide I don't like it. We'll go ahead and crop it out. And now I can focus on just my beautiful magic umbrella and our bottle. Color picker, I kind of showed already, it allows you to pick a color from the image inside of the bounding box and turn your brush to that color. Your brush options are going to be another way of selecting color. You can also manually alter the size of your brush, but I do prefer to use the left bracket and right bracket hotkeys. One thing I also like to call out here, though, is that you can make this transparent. So if you really just want to influence a little bit of color, over an area that you're in painting. Let's say, for example, I wanted to make this a little bit more of a yellow chair, but I still want to have a lot of that um, color in it. Uh, I can use transparent color to guide that in painting. 
We've covered the move tool, reset view brings us back to a centered image. Merge visible will actually take all of the image information that's being stored in the browser and kind of compress it down. So if you see that Invoke is slowing down, merging the visible images will actually compile everything into a single image, bring that back into the canvas and hopefully give you a little bit of that performance back. Saving to the gallery will save the current canvas directly to your gallery. You also have the option here to save the box region only. So when that option is off, it'll save everything on the canvas, regardless of where the bounding box is. If you have saved box region only, it's only going to save the image that's inside the bounding box. So if I wanted to take a little snapshot of my bottle and then another one of my chair and umbrella, I could do that with this tool. Copy to clipboard will take your canvas and copy that to your clipboard. Downloading it as an image will download to an area that you select. You've got your undo and redo buttons, control Z and control shift Z. You have an upload and a clear canvas button. Upload will wipe your canvas and upload it with something else that you're uploading. Let's say a photo of your dog. Clear canvas will just reset the canvas back to its initial start state. Lastly, we have our canvas settings. Show intermediates will show a preview of the progress that Invoke is making as it's generating. Show Grid will allow you to turn the grid on or off. Snap to Grid will allow you to disable the grid snapping feature if you want to really focus your bounding box on a specific area. You can always turn that back on to snap back to the grid. Uh, the important thing to note about the grid, each of these boxes is 64 by 64, which is a very important size in the generation process. Without going into too many technical details, there's a reason why your width and height have to be in 64 pixel increments. And this grid is designed to enforce that as well. Auto save to gallery will save every incremental version of the canvas directly to your gallery. This allows you to kind of go back and comb through the development of the canvas, but do know it creates a lot of images depending on how long you're spending in the canvas. Limit strokes to box allows you to limit your drawing inside of the box. So I'll go ahead and move my opacity back up. You'll notice that no matter how hard I try, I can't go outside of this box. But if I turn limit the strokes off, I can now go outside of the bounding box. And if I turn darken outside selection off, you'll see that it is the exact same color. Canvas debug info will actually give you a couple of useful bits of detail if you're trying to debug something for us but otherwise it's probably not super useful to you. You've got clear canvas history and empty temp image folder as well. Both of these just clear up some of the data that's being stored on the back end to support the canvas process. So that's it for the basics video of how to use the unified canvas. Hopefully you got a little bit more of the how-to out of this video than our original release, but we'll be aiming to do some additional advanced tips and tricks for using the tool and getting higher quality outputs less notable seams, and more nuanced styles.